our hypothesis is that it, the tumor's microenvironment is an important player in uh, tumor progression and resistance to treatment. And what we have learned in our work over the years is that the microenvironment of tumor is highly abnormal. And each component of this abnormal microenvironment facilitates uh, resistance to treatment. And our hypothesis is that if we can repair these abnormalities, or in an engineering term you would say, if we can re-engineer the tumor microenvironment so it begins to resemble more normal microenvironment, then perhaps we can improve uh, various treatments in cancer patients. So uh, a tumor, a tumor is like an organ, like a tissue. It has cancer cells that drive the process, but uh, cancer cells cannot alone can kill a patient until they can co-op the host. And these host components are known as microenvironment. And they include blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and a variety of host cells, cells from the patient that are in the tumor. And they include fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, cells of the immune system, the resident cells like macrophages or transiting cells like T cells. And each of these components are embedded in an extracellular matrix, which is made out of collagen and hyaluron and, and other proteins and other substances. And then each of these components of the tumor microenvironment are abnormal. And uh, what we have been trying to do in our laboratory for the last two decades is try to repair each of these components and then test these concepts in patients. So we have done a number of clinical trials to test these ideas, and they have held up so far. They're supportive of this concept. Let me just step back a little bit. One of the major causes of tumor progression and resistance to treatment is hypoxia, low oxygen level, or low pH in tumors. And tumors create this microenvironment of low pH and hypoxia by making the blood vessels of the tumor abnormal. And the abnormality of the tumor vessels stems from two reasons. Number one, tumor vessels are compressed by cancer cells. What is even more important, they're compressed by the matrix, both collagen and hyaluron. And then the second reason why the tumor vessels are abnormal is because they're leaky. So we had to take, develop different strategies for each of those. So just to give you an idea, one of the most deadly human tumors is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma where the survival rate, five-year survival rates, have not really budged in over 30 years. They are around 5 to 6 percent. <clears throat> now, what's remarkable about this tumor is only 5 percent of the cells in this tumor are cancer cells. 95 percent is the microenvironment. So that tells you the most deadly tumor is deadly because of not 5 percent cells, but because of 95 percent. And of this 95%, a good fraction of this is collagen and hyaluronin. And what this does is it compresses tumor vessels. So 80% of the blood vessels in a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma are compressed, are squished. And therefore, the flow just doesn't go through them. And if there's no blood flow in those areas, it's going to cause low oxygen levels. And this hypoxia is going to have many different consequences. It's causes immunosuppression, inflammation, causes resistance to radiation therapy, number of chemotherapeutic agents, causes resistance to immune therapy, and then the list goes on and on. So we decided to alleviate hypoxia and tumors by decompressing blood vessels, by, by somehow opening them up. And what we discovered is that we can do this by depleting collagen and hyaluronin from these tumors. So we've been looking at a number of strategies to do that. And uh, what I'll talk about on Monday is one such strategy. That is to use widely prescribed antihypertensive drugs that are given to patients worldwide so they're very safe. And what they do is they indeed decrease collagen level and hormone level in tumors and pancreatic cancer. And they open up the blood vessels. They reduce hypoxia. And you can deliver your drugs. You can deliver immune cells. And radiation works better because oxygen is there. 
So this is one of the approaches for normalizing the microenvironment. So you're, do, you're repairing the matrix and you're opening up vessels. So that's the strategy. Well, it's, it's a very important question. I don't think we have the definite answer to that question, but at least my hypothesis, it is there. We have done some studies in the very early stages of carcinogenesis, like during pre-neoplasia, pre and the two stages are called hyperplasia and dysplasia, before frank neoplasia sets in. What we have found out that the microenvironment is all abnormal at that time. So the blood vessels begin to get squeezed at that time. The lymphatics begin to get squeezed at that time. And therefore, the tumor cancer cells, before they become, frankly, neoplastic, they're only preparing the microenvironment. They're preparing the niche where they come to grow. So there, essentially, if you look at a tumor, it essentially recapitulates a lot of the embryonic programming. I mean, it just comes at the wrong time, but it exploits that very, I mean, that's where all the various transcription factors that are involved in embryogenesis also get uh, activated uh, during the tumorogenesis. So your point is well taken. So some of those tumor elements, uh, tumor microenvironment phenocopies some of the embryonic microenvironment. Except a lot of the proteins that come up, they're mutated. They don't have the same uh, structure, so to speak, or function as you would see in embryo. This concept, which I discuss about using antihypertensive drug, there's a trial going on, started in May of 2013 at Mass General Hospital, being led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ted Hong, where uh, he's combined, I'm not involved in this trial because of conflicts of interest issue, which uh, I mentioned to you earlier. But uh, my colleague, Dr. Ted Hong, is leading this trial, where he's combining losartan, which is a generic antihypertensive drug, and he's combining with the standard of care chemotherapy known as Folfirinox. It's a four drug combination. And he's combining it with the losartan. And then uh, he is giving radiation using proton beam and then seeing how it affects. Uh, and he, it's a very sophisticated trial design. And it's on the clinicaltrials.gov. If you see, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a really a pioneering trial. This is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, yeah. which are the majority of pancreatic cancers, and the ones where just we haven't made much progress. Well, if you, you know, oxygenation also helps radiation, okay. in addition to chemotherapy. So this is the rationale. Okay. Yeah. So this is just one. But again, as I said to you, uh, one approach to repair the vessels is through opening them up. And 25% of the human tumors 25% have compressed vessels like this. So this concept, if, if it works in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, it's going to have, you can, I can tell you the implications of that. I mean, you can deduce them. So we should know the results. And, uh, and of course, while that this trial is going on, our laboratory is also developing better antihypertensive drugs that can be, that are even more effective. So, Let's see what happens. Hopefully, we'll know the answers for that in the next several years. But as I said to you, that's only one uh, component of normality, the abnormal matrix. <clears throat> the, blood the blood vessels in the tumor are also leaky. And if, you have a, if you're watering your lawn, and suddenly, if you put a leak in, your, in, the, in the hose or the pipe, what will happen to the water? It will begin to shut down. It will not flow as rapidly. That's exactly what happens to tumors. The tumor blood vessels are leaky. And this leakiness makes the blood flow quite sluggish in tumors. So again, it creates hypoxia. And so what we proposed in 2001 is a very controversial idea that let's use antiangiogenic drugs to repair this leakiness. And you can imagine it was not very well received because at that time, the whole, th the whole concept of antiangiogenic therapy was to starve the tumor, to simply shut off the blood supply. And I was trying to propose the opposite. Let's fix the blood supply. Let's improve the perfusion in a tumor. 
and uh, and then once you do that, then the hypoxia will you know would go down. pH will begin to move towards normal, and the same thing as I said earlier by opening our vessels with the decompression, same kind of advantages will come in. The tumor immunosuppressive microenvironment will become immunostimulatory. Drugs will get in there, will begin to work better. Radiation will work better. Immune therapy will work better. And the list goes on and on. So now we tested this first in animal models. So I proposed this idea in 2001. That's what, 13 years ago. So we did a number of uh, preclinical studies to test this concept. And indeed, that was happening if you use a lower dose of antiangiogenic therapy. So then we did the very first clinical trial in Mass General, led by my colleague, Dr. Chris Willett, in rectal carcinoma patients using bevacizumab, or Avestin, whichever the word uh, you're comfortable with. And we found out, indeed, the blood vessels were getting repaired, normalized with Avestin. But once we finished that work, it led to the next set of questions. When does normalization come set in? When does it end? Does it really benefit patients? So we went back to the bench side, began to work with brain tumors and mice. We answered all those questions. What we found out that the normalization begins in a day, but unfortunately lasts only five days in mice. But the good news is if you give radiation during these five days, the outcome is far superior if compared to if you give it before or after normalization window. So again, this raised the next set of questions. What about patients? So with my colleague, Dr. Tracy Batchelor, who is the head of neuro-oncology at Mass General Hospital, we initiated a number of clinical trials in, in uh, glioblastoma and brain tumors. And uh, as we had anticipated, there is a window of normalization in patients. It's about a month. Not as long as we would like it. In patients, we would like it to be six months because that's how that's a total course of chemo radiation therapy. But nevertheless, the, the most exciting finding came when we found out in our very first recurrent glioblastoma trial that had 30 patients, that in seven out of 30 patients, blood perfusion actually went up after you gave anti-angiogenic therapy. Now remember, this until that point, the whole field is thinking anti-angiogenic therapy, starving tumors. And guess what? These seven patients, the one where perfusion went up, these patients lived six months longer, median survival, compared to the way the perfusion went down or remained stable. So when you finish that trial, that was very, very gratifying that uh, now we know how to select cancer patients who would actually benefit. We also know not to give this drug to 23 other patients because these drugs are toxic, they're expensive. But again, with one trial, you cannot you know, deduce. Uh, so we said, okay, let's do another trial. So Dr. Batchelor completed a second trial, this one on um, newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. And this trial had 40 patients in it. And 20 patients out of 40, blood perfusion went up went up after anti-angiogenic therapy. Yes, of course, yeah, yeah, we, we did this with MRI, yes, okay. yeah, sorry. So, uh, so then what we found out is that these 20 patients had a median survival, which was about nine months longer than the patients where the perfusion went down or remained stationary. So now we have two trials, right, where we can show this in GBN. So one could say, all right, well, maybe it's specific to GBM. So there are two unpublished studies right now, but the abstracts were presented, uh, the, they were presented at ESCO meetings, where the same thing has been seen with bevacizumab in uh, breast cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. So those studies have not been published yet, so they are unpublished data, but uh, they have been presented at ESCO. So it looks like this principle of Decreasing hypoxia by repairing blood vessels seems to make sense. Originally, so the anti-VEGF or anti-bevacizumab, which is an antibody against VEGF, VEGF was originally discovered at Harvard, not as VEGF, but as VPF by Dr. Harold Dvorak. He called it vascular permeability factor. So, the effect of VEGF is it's a double-edged sword. 
it makes blood vessels leaky and it, which reduces perfusion. But VEGF is also a survival factor for endothelial cells. So if you remove just a little bit of VEGF, you repair the leak, you improve the perfusion. If you give too much VEGF, you're taking away the, the growth factor endothelial cells need to survive. And then what happens, you shut down the blood flow. That was the original idea. So the idea is uh, the, 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 what we need to do is give just a judicious dose, personalize the dose. You cannot give the same dose to every patient. So the dose maybe need to be titrated based on imaging. And uh, those are some of the questions from my Dr. Tracy Batchelor and other oncologists at Massachusetts General Hospital are right now answering yeah, and asking in different trials. And the other thing we're trying to do is figure out what can we add to bevacizumab so that normalization window is longer and more stable. And so we have some leads in that, and we are we're working on that. 